Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our webinar on nourishing children with food allergy. My name is Lori Harada, and I'm the Executive Director of Food Allergy Canada. I have the honor of introducing our guest speaker today, Linda Kirst, a registered dietitian from HealthLink BC's Dietitian and Physical Activity Services. Linda operates the Allergy Nutrition Service, a telepractice-based service that provides nutrition education and counseling, including follow-up care to BC residents who have food allergy concerns. She's also the Allied Health Section Co-Chair for the Canadian Society of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Before we start today's webinar, I wanted to go over a few housekeeping items. First, all participants are muted so we can keep the audio clear for the webinar. Secondly, during the presentation, please feel free to submit your questions in the chat box. We will have a Q&A session after Linda's presentation and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. This webinar will be recorded and shared on our site within the next several days in case you want to go back and watch it again or tell others about it. Now, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Linda. Thank you for your kind words, Lori. It is my pleasure to be with you today and to participate with our audience on this webinar. Before I begin, I wish to acknowledge that food and patterns of eating are inherently personal. Furthermore, that each child with food allergy has different food restrictions, dietary concerns, and nutrition needs. In nourishing children with food allergy, I will be providing general information about dietary management of food allergy. This presentation does not replace medical advice nor an individualized nutrition care plan to address your child's unique needs. Please contact your child's health care provider for help with managing your child's dietary and related health care needs. I'd like to start with a broad overview of the connection between a healthy and adequate diet and normal growth in childhood. Then follow with an overview of the potential nutrition concerns of food allergy. I'll spend most of the remaining presentation portion of the webinar addressing some strategies for supporting adequate and balanced nutrient intakes. I'll finish off with a few suggested resources before taking questions. What is meant by normal growth? Well, generally, normal growth refers to three main patterns. Firstly, that a child's weight compared to their height remains reasonably proportional. Two, that their height is generally in line with their genetic potential. This means that the, their height compared to that of children of the same age is similar to that of their parents compared to other adults. In other words, if a child's two parents are taller than average, then we would anticipate the child to be on the taller side compared to other children of the same age. And thirdly, that the rate of growth puts them in or close to one of the channels of the growth curves shown here on the growth charts for boys and girls. And for the most part, that they stay near or in the same channel as they grow older. Monitoring growth is an important part of regular health checkups for all children. The reason is that normal growth is one of several signs of a healthy and adequate diet unexpected growth changes or an early warning of a possible health or nutrition problem and should be delved into to find a cause as well as a solution. So what is healthy? What is a healthy and adequate diet? Well, it turns out there's no single definition. One sums up healthy eating very succinctly as variety, moderation, and balance. While definitions vary, most focus on foods and not on nutrients. Variety, moderation, and balance reminds us that at the core, healthy eating is about a variety of foods eaten in moderation and in balance to each other. It is through a healthy and adequate diet that the human body can acquire the whole range of nutrients it needs. For children, a healthy and adequate diet supports nutrient intakes that enable them to grow and develop normally. So this is where Canada's food guide comes in. While it is not perfect it is ex and ex is expected to be refreshed by the Canadian government in 2018, it still serves as a useful reference. Importantly, it serves as a translation of nutrient needs of children um, into the foods that Canadians commonly eat. 
It gives meaning to the idea of mod mod sorry, variety, moderation, and balance by defining four food groups plus fats and oils, serving sizes, and recommendations for the number of servings from each of each food group across different age groups to promote adequate intakes. It follows then that food allergy can challenge a child's ability to meet their nutrient needs as their food choices decrease. Food allergy can make variety, moderation, and balance harder to achieve. A single food allergy, for instance, can influence food choices from multiple food groups. That's because most of us eat prepared foods from a range of ingredients across a number of food groups. And in fact, dietary restrictions due to food allergies often lead to parental concern about whether their child is getting enough nutrition. These worries are well founded. We know from scientific reports and research that children with food allergy are more likely than children without food allergy to be at increased risk of lower nutrient intakes and slower growth potentially. It has been shown, and the good news is, that with access to nutrition education and counseling, these risks can be addressed. Furthermore, when adequate nutrient intakes and slow growth have developed, they can be corrected, especially when identified early. One way to think of the nutritional issues of food allergy in childhood is to compare the situations of a child on a sidewalk, a balance beep, and a slack line. A child with food allergy can be likened to a child racing, sorry, a child without food allergy can be likened to a child racing along a sidewalk. Under normal parental supervision, an accidental fall is unlikely to result in a serious injury. Likewise, a child without food allergy is unlikely to experience a significant risk to their nutrient intakes or growth if they don't eat, adequate, eat an adequate diet, as it's likely not to last very long. The situation is different for the child with food allergy. Their situation can be compared to the child walking on the balance beam or slack line. As the number of food allergies or food restrictions increases, so do the risks or hazards. But as we can visualize the increasing potential risk across these images, we can also see the opportunities. By keeping a watchful eye, by learning and acquiring the skills to support their child with food allergy, a parent can not only ensure that they're getting the nutrients they need, but also teach them the knowledge and skills to be successful at managing their food allergies themselves as they grow older. For the balance of this talk, I'm going to turn to some general tips for supporting adequate nutrient intakes with a focus on five groups of common food allergens. These are milk, egg, peanuts and tree nuts, wheat and fish. I'll aim to finish uh, this part of the talk with some overall strategies for supporting adequate nutrient intakes, including energy or calories. I'd also like to touch on fostering healthy eating behaviors and feeding skills. So turning to milk allergy. Milk is a key source of many nutrients, not just calcium. It is, of course, used uh, to make many other foods including cheeses, yogurt, and butter. It's also used to many, make many prepared foods from pasta dishes all the way to muffins. Milk is an important source of protein, fat, calcium, and vitamins A, B12, D, and riboflavin. While there can be other sources of these foods in a carefully thought through diet plan, the vast majority of us have come to rely on milk and milk products for these nutrients. Therefore, when faced with the necessity to remove dairy from the diet, it can leave a large nutrition gap. There are data um, from scientific studies and reports to back this up. There are some recommendations for filling the nutrition gap due to milk allergy. For children between one and two years of age, a step two version of a tolerated infant formula is considered nutritionally equivalent to whole or full fat cow milk. For many milk allergic children, a step two soy based formula should be considered. The step two designation refers to the age group that the formula is intended for. Step two products are intended for infants and children six months of age and older. Usually, after two years of age, the high fat content of formula is no longer necessary. Therefore, a step two formula can be replaced by a fortified soy beverage. The fat content of a fortified soy beverage is similar to a 2% cow's milk. Some young children with milk allergy may uh, 
continue to take substantial amounts of breast milk. These children are likely to get many of the nutrients they need without cow's milk or tolerated step 2 formula, except for calcium and vitamin D. It is recommended that breastfed children be offered a vitamin D supplement. After one year of age, the dose may need to be increased slightly though. Breastfed infants after, sorry, breastfed children after one year of age may also need a calcium supplement to get the daily recommended amount. Even if they're drinking some step 2 formula or a fortified soy beverage as well as breast milk. When it comes to other dairy alternatives such as dairy-free cheeses and yogurt, keep in mind they're not nutritionally equivalent. Most have very little to no appreciable amounts of calcium and vitamin D and may be low in protein. But these products still have a place, I think, in a child's diet. A homemade pizza that is topped with a dairy-free cheese can be a satisfying menu item for everyone in the family. Topped with ham for protein or served with a chickpea salad with, uh, will provide the additional protein as well as other nutrients. On another note, since we know milk allergy is often outgrown, milk allergic children should ideally have their milk allergy monitored by a pediatric allergist. A pediatric allergist can evaluate whether a controlled amount of milk baked into a home prepared muffin that is absolutely thoroughly bake, baked would be tolerated. Also, periodic monitoring of the milk allergy increases the likelihood that an, an outgrown milk allergy will be detected, enabling a child uh, to have milk and milk products added to their diet sooner than later. I've added this slide to illustrate uh, what to look for when choosing a fortified soy beverage. This is a nutrition facts table. Note, nutrients are listed down the left-hand column and the daily values down the right. Daily, daily values represent the, the proportion of the daily recommended intake that is met for a reference individual in one serving of, of the beverage. A fortified soy beverage here shows um, provides 10% of the daily value for vitamin A, 30% for calcium, 45% for vitamin D, 25% for riboflavin and 50% for vitamin B12. Note that while it appears two 250 ml servings would supply 90% of the daily value for vitamin D, this is not necessarily adequate for a child and depends on other foods that they're eating or able to eat. Turning to egg allergy, um, egg allergy can have a big impact on a child's diet too, but Often in, it has a different impact than milk allergy. While eggs contain protein, iron, vitamins A, B12, and D, and riboflavin, unlike milk, there are many other foods that contain similar nutrients. The bigger impact of egg allergy can be actually on the child's grain and grain, grain product intake, such as muffins, loaves, and other bakery items, pastas, and some casseroles. Egg allergy can also have a big impact on foods that are socially important to us, such as cookies, celebratory cakes, and Sunday um, brunch foods. To help a child with egg allergy to be able to eat more family foods, I recommend aiming to use egg replacements in recipes whenever reasonable. There are a range of egg alternatives that work, depending on what one is making, such as ground flaxseed, vinegar, and banana. Egg allergy is also often outgrown and may be tolerated with tolerated when baked thoroughly into a muffin recipe. As with baked milk, tolerance should be first determined by a pediatric allergist before offering baked egg to an egg allergic child. Peanut and tree nuts are challenging nutritionally, not so much because they are a unique source of nutrients, but because they're also ingredients or cross-contaminates in so many foods, prepared dishes and convenience and snack foods. Peanut and tree nuts are great sources of energy, protein, healthy fats, dietary fiber, sources of iron and other minerals such as potassium and, and magnesium. Terrific alternatives include a range of seeds as they're also packed with protein, healthy fats, fiber and minerals and so forth. Examples include flax, hemp, pumpkin, sesame, and sunflower seeds. Many of them substitute in cooking and meal planning. For example, seed substitutes for nuts in homemade granola, trail mixes, and can be added to hot cereals. 
Seed butters such as pumpkin and sunflower can be substituted for peanut butter in meals and snacks. A pediatric allergist can also play an important role in supporting a child with peanut and tree nut allergies. They can determine whether a child would tolerate one of the specific tree nuts. If an allergist determines a specific tree nut is tolerated, the next step would be to identify a source of that tree nut that isn't cross-contaminated with other tree nuts. Tree nuts, peanuts, and seeds are often processed in the same facilities, so even though seeds are not tree nuts, some sources are cross-contaminated. I encourage a family who is seeking help in finding seeds and tolerated tree nuts that are not cross-contaminated to reach out to a registered dietitian or other qualified health professional to identify some possible leads on appropriate sources, especially if they're challenged in finding a source on their own. So shifting to wheat allergy, wheat, like milk, is a major source of key nutrients in the diet for most families. For children, it is an important source of carbohydrate, dietary fiber, the B, the B vitamins, um, including thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, folate, and the minerals iron and others. Having it removed from the diet has important nutrition, nutritional implications. There are a range of other grains to choose from uh, as alternatives to wheat, and here are some examples. They include amaranth, buckwheat, chia, corn, millet, oats, quinoa, rice, rye, sorghum, and teff. As a nutrition strategy for wheat allergy, aim to offer multiple different whole grains daily or weekly, as no single alternative is entirely equivalent to wheat. The more variety of grains substituting for wheat, the better. Select whole grains as much as that is reasonable. For example, brown rice and brown rice flour over white rice and white rice flour. While refined or white re sorry, while refined or white wheat flour is fortified by law, other refined flours are not. As a result, many gluten-free products made from refined flours, while they may be wheat-free, are not likely to be fortified. For cooking, whole grains tend to add more flavor. In baking, flour blends tend to perform better than single grains or single flours. Muffins, breads, and cakes made from flour blends tend to have a nicer texture. Legume flour or bean flour added to flour blends add structure and tend to be moister. Some non-wheat grains, oats being a good example, are cross-contaminated with wheat. This has to do with where and how oat crops are grown in Canada harvested and processed. There are oat suppliers though um, that specialize in uncontaminated oats, so wheat-free oats are available on the market. The list of alternative grains for children with wheat allergy may need some tailoring, as some children will have an allergy to other grains as well. Ideas and cooking, sorry, ideas and skills for cooking and baking with alternative grains can take some time and support to develop. I encourage parents to reach out for support to develop the knowledge, skills, and confidence to feel successful in managing wheat allergy. Turning to fish. Fish is an important source of protein, omega-3 fatty acids, vitamin D, and iron. While there are many other foods rich in protein and iron, there are not as many alternative sources of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. Let's delve uh, a little deeper here. Omega-3 fatty acids in fish are called EPA and DHA. The body can make these from alpha-linolenic acid, or ALA for short. If fish is not part of the diet, we think the body benefits from more ALA. This means a fish-free diet is higher quality in general when plenty of ALA-rich oils are included. ALA-rich oils include canola oil and flax oil. They're also found in ground flaxseed, soybeans, tofu, and walnuts. And if appropriate, omega-3 enriched eggs can be used as a source of DHA and sea vegetables or seaweed uh, as a source of EPA. It is also recommended to keep the diet rich in monounsaturated fats. Excellent sources include olive and avocado oils, 
monounsaturated fats help encourage the conversion of ALA in the body to EPA and DHA. So this concludes the focus on the five groups of common food allergens I wanted to cover. Let's shift now to um, a couple of other topics related to supporting adequate nutrient intakes in children. As one aims to prepare child and family foods free of one's child's food allergens, there is an, a tendency to uh, forgo many of the commercial foods, restaurant and convenience foods, and turn to homemade foods from fresh ingredients instead. For most households, this means that the overall diet can become lower in, in fat and calories. While most adults might receive this as welcome news for themselves, um, but children, especially young children, because they have very high energy needs, require a more fat-rich diet to meet the demands of their growth. I've included in this slide some suggested strategies for upping the fat content of meals and foods offered to children. Consider adding seed butters to warm cereal and ground seeds to cold cereals, avocado wedges and bread toppings or as a side dish. Drizzles of avocado um, or olive oil, canola oils as well, on pasta and other dishes. Hummus and tahini um, can be served as a dip um, or a cracker topping, and seeds and seed butters can be added to snacks. As oils and fats add wonderfully to the taste of food, add them with that in mind at several meals and snacks a day. With this, my last set of slides on supporting adequate nutrient intakes. I've included some strategies that support healthy eating and feeding skills in children. I'm acknowledging that healthy eating is just as much about nurturing supportive behaviors, attitudes and skills as it is about offering appropriate foods to children. Supporting healthy eating behaviors and feeding skills in children takes time and asks us as parents to think about our own behaviors and the attitudes that we bring to the table. If you feel you need help with this, you're not alone. I encourage you to reach out for help. Reaching out to a pediatric dietitian is a great place to start. So what are some strategies that support healthy eating behaviors and skills in children? Well, they include offering variety, moderation, and balance when planning meals, offering new foods, flavors, and textures regularly, and family foods as much as that is possible. If a substitute is needed, choose a similar style food. Keep in mind what gets offered to your child is your responsibility, not your child's. Children should not be dictating what gets served at the table. If parents offer only what has been prepared, in general, children will have less difficulty accepting, eating, and enjoying those foods. Give your child some time to accept new foods and tastes. Expect your child won't necessarily be enthusiastic about a new food right away. This is normal. Keep offering the food and strive to withhold your judgment on whether or not uh, they've, um, they, they've eaten it. Accept a new food. Accepting a new food by a child can take weeks sometimes. If you, f if you feel a food should remain on your family menu, keep offering it. Give autonomy to your child to self-feed and offer support as needed. Allow your child to feed themselves. They're getting an opportunity to practice important self-feeding skills uh, that do take time to develop. Honor your child's appetite. While well, it's your job as a parent to choose the right foods for meals and snacks, deciding how much gets eaten is not. Let your child decide how much to eat. Honor your child's decision about how much they eat will increase their enjoyment of the meal and generally will help them eat better as a result. Accept developmentally appropriate mealtime behavior. Children learn through play, and this includes how to eat and relate to food. Accept play with food and messiness at the table. These are normal stages in a child's development. Establish meal and snack time structure, the where and when. Older infants and children thrive on structure as it relates to meal and snack time. Establish routines around um, where meals and snacks are eaten and when. For example, at the kitchen table, at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack times. When your child is in other settings, 
strive to foster the same general structure. You're likely to notice similar patterns are being established in your child's child care and in school settings. Foster a positive, relaxed atmosphere at mealtime. Turn off the television. Keep phones, other screens, digital devices, and toys away from the table. Eat meals together and role model the behaviors you're desiring. Children will adopt their caregivers' mealtime habits, both good and not so good. Model the behavior you're desiring in your child. For example, if you would like your child to drink water at mealtime, try to do so yourself. Involve your child in meal planning and meal preparation. Children who are involved in age-appropriate meal planning and preparation learn valuable skills, are more engaged with food and mealtime, and therefore tend to eat better. Consider baking or cooking items that enable them to help with safe tasks under your supervision. Your child with food allergy who enjoys the foods they can eat can relate to meal preparation and mealtime as fun and as a social activity and is more likely to become successful at coping with their food allergies as they grow older. This brings me to the end of the presentation portion of the webinar. Um, and so to summarize the talk, while children with food allergies may be at increased risk of lower nutrient intakes, access to nutrition counseling services can help support a healthy and adequate diet and normal growth and development. If you have questions or concerns about your child's eating patterns or their ability to meet their nutrient needs, ask their primary care provider for a referral to a registered dietitian. Strategies to support optimal nutrient intakes include offering family food, family friendly nutrient rich alternatives to food allergens, knowing how and feeling confident about supporting healthy eating and feeding behaviors, having the status of your child's food allergies reassessed from time to time by your child's pediatric allergist, and having their growth monitored. In this, my last slide. I've added a few resources for your consideration. Pediatric dietitians are accessed either through your local hospital, outpatient service, community health center, or private practice. Bear in mind some dietitian services require your child to be referred by their family doctor or nurse practitioner. You can find a directory of private practice dietitians through the Dietitians of Canada website shown here. A pediatric allergist or allergist nearest to you can be identified through the Provincial College of Physicians and Surgeons for your province. Once in the directory, do a search for the specialty allergy and clinical immunology. Pediatric allergists are also pediatricians, by the way, and no child or infant is too young to be seen by one if needed. The Ellen Satter Institute is a fabulous repository of information and resources for fostering healthy eating and, and feeding behaviors. I've included the website here as well. Food Allergy Canada, the Food Inspection Agency, and Allergic Living uh, also offer terrific websites and are great resources. And um, speaking to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, if you go to their website, you'll be able to find local office phone numbers that you can reach out to. They're a great resource if you have questions about uh, the Canadian food supply, um, specifically around food allergens. So I encourage you to reach out to them if you have those kinds of questions. And finally, there are a number of um, wonderful books out there, and this one in particular um, by Scott Sisher is um, uh, a terrific one on food allergies. Um, listed here is a second edition that was just recently published. So at this point, I'm going to turn it back to Lori. Um, your screen uh, may momentarily go dark as we make the transition over to Lori's slides. Thank you, Linda, for a really interesting talk. And I really like that last slide, too. Those resources are helpful. Uh, just a reminder for our audience, you will be able to see the webinar, uh, which we'll post in several days if you didn't get a chance to write down some of those website links. Um, Linda, we've had several questions come in during your presentation that we want to go through. So the first one is, is rice milk a healthy alternative to cow's milk? Thank you, Lori. Um, that's a good question. A rice beverage um, is, is not as nutrient rich, actually, as cow's milk. Rice beverage has very little protein and therefore really is 
isn't comparable to cow's milk. If rice beverage is taken, it can't replace milk on its own. An additional serving or two from the meat and meat alternatives group, um, according to Canada's Food Guide, should be added to the diet to provide the protein that is missing uh, from the rice beverage. Um, if one is choosing rice beverage, when selecting one for purchase, it is like soy beverage. Choose one that is fortified with calcium and the vitamins A, uh, B12, D, and riboflavin. Like soy beverage, uh, rice beverage is lower in fat um, than whole milk, and for this reason, and the fact that it has a little protein, it is not recommended at all for children under two years of age. Okay, thank you. Good to know. Um, the next question uh, is from a parent who has probably a vegan child. So mm -hmm. the question is, how do vegan kids stay healthy um, if they also have nut allergies? Because you talked about the the benefits of having nut in the diet or nuts in the diet as well. Mm -hmm. So outlined in the slide on peanut and tree nut allergy, um, a variety of seeds in the diet offer very a very similar nutrient profile to that found in, in peanut and tree nuts. Vegan children can have a healthy diet if they're offered a wide range of vegetables, fruits, grains, beans, or otherwise known as legumes and seeds daily. A fortified soy beverage would be recommended in place of milk, uh, or if they're younger than two years, a, a step two soy-based formula. Vegan children, uh, just as omnivorous children, uh, benefit from uh, being breastfed to two years of age and beyond. Fortified soy beverages or soy formulas are important sources of vitamin B12 in vegan children. Um, vegan children should uh, also have plenty of vegetable oil sources um, that are rich in omega-3s and monounsaturated fats um, uh, added during cooking, meal preparation, or even at the table. Uh, vegan children with food allergy may benefit quite a bit from a visit with a pediatric dietitian. Just to double check that there are no nutrition gaps, um, for some vegan children, a closer look, especially at their iron intake, um, vitamin B12 and, and vitamin D um, is, uh, is probably especially helpful. Okay, thank you. Um, we've had a few comments too, again, from parents whose kids have multiple food allergies, and they're wondering, what are some good snack ideas for kids with multiple food allergies? Mm -hmm. Maybe a good place to start is to ask the question, what is a healthy snack? Well, in general, um, a, a, a healthy snack might include um, at least two food groups. Ideally, three or, or four food groups, actually. So with that as a background, um, practically speaking, a great snack um, would also be something that is easy to prepare and, and is uh, easy to have on hand. Examples of a healthy snack um, include whole grain crackers, uh, muffin or bread with a cheese or seed butter or a bean dip topping along with, um, say, fruit uh, or a vegetable and fortified soy beverage. So that's four, four food groups covered there. The muffin or bread uh, may be homemade um, from tolerated flours. And um, a great idea uh, may be to do some of that home baking in batches and to freeze it. And uh, they would then be uh, readily available um, during snap snack time, whether it be at home or um, when one is on the road. Well, that's a really good tip. I know having a son with multiple food allergies, it was always very helpful. If I had my act together to uh, prep things and have them on hand in the freezer for, for a quick snack, so thanks for that one. Um, there are also parents, Linda, whose kids have been diagnosed with an allergy already, and they're wondering, like with one food allergy, what's the best way to proceed when they're introducing other highly allergenic foods. Do you have tips for that? Mm -hmm. Generally, if a child has been diagnosed with a, a, a with a food allergy, other highly allergenic foods uh, can and should be introduced. Okay. Uh, there is one exception, actually, and if the food allergy is to egg, it is now recommended that the child be screened for peanut allergy before peanut is introduced. The screening uh, should be offered sooner than later, as we know that 
uh, the younger the child in general, the greater the likelihood that um, another highly allergenic food will be tolerated. Um, and that uh, certainly includes peanuts. So um, if there's egg allergy, screening for peanut allergy first. And if there's an all clear uh, after the screening, then introducing that uh, as early as is reasonable, closer to uh, the ages um, um, that uh, the parent has been given the, the all clear to go ahead. Uh, the more allergenic foods, by the way, are um, the common allergens, namely milk, egg, peanut, tree nut, uh, wheat, fish, mollusks, crustaceans, uh, sesame seeds, and soy. Once a common food allergen has been introduced, it is recommended that we um, um, include that food in the child's diet on a regular basis. Um, by that we mean uh, maybe uh, a few times a week or so. Uh, the idea is that um, when that food is tolerated, if it's ingested regularly, that's reminding the immune system uh, to, to continue tolerating that food. So we can actually be proactive by keeping those foods um, in the diet um, uh, and, and possibly prevent other food allergies from developing. Of course, if a food allergy develops, one stops um, offering that food and seeking medical clarity as to what's going on. When a parent uh, asks this question of me, I think it's also important to get a little bit more background as to why they're asking it. For some parents, learning their child has food allergy or seeing their child experience an allergic reaction uh, has left them feeling apprehensive about adding new foods to their child's diet. If this is the case, I think a parent should reach out to the right healthcare resources to address their apprehension. Um, for example, a parent might feel uncomfortable about introducing other new foods because they're feeling unsure about um, unsure um, what they should do if they think their child is having a severe reaction. Getting the help they need on this matter um, potentially uh, starting with an appointment with, with their child's primary care provider is an important step um, to build confidence and a sense of feeling ready to introduce those other common allergens. I think it's also important um, and a confidence building step to feel able to um, read food labels accurately and to be able to choose foods that are appropriate for their child who has recently been diagnosed with food allergy. So reaching out for help and learning those label reading skills can be a great asset as well for moving forward. Okay, thank you. And just um, a reminder for our audience, uh, Linda was talking about um, early infant feeding where there's already egg allergy. Uh, if you weren't able to visit our webinar before, we do have on our archive under foodallergycanada.ca under webinars, there's a webinar on the early infant feeding guidelines for peanut delivered by Dr. Julia Upton and there's one for healthcare professionals delivered by Dr. Edmund Chan. So thanks for that one, Linda. Um, the next question is asking for on guidance on label reading for soy and dairy allergies. Can you speak to that, please? Mm -hmm. Well, in 2012, the Government of Canada passed a new law on label reading, or sorry, food labeling. Um, this law requires that all common food allergens added to food be listed in plain language in the ingredient list or immediately below the ingredient list in the form of a contained statement. This law requires that uh, food allergens be listed regardless of the amount of the allergen in the food. And plain language means that the uh, food allergen is identified by every um, by the, uh, using the everyday uh, words that we use to identify them. For example, if milk or a milk component is added to a food such as casein or whey, the label must include the word milk. Um, so the reader unfamiliar with the words casein or whey would still be able to know that the food contains milk. Another type of uh, allergen labeling is called precautionary labeling. Um, this kind of labeling um, uh, and may be used uh, but is not required uh, to indicate despite adherence to good manufacturing processes that the food may contain uh, some of the seeded allergen. Food um, uh, that includes a precautionary statement about a specific allergen such as soy uh, should in, uh, in general not be eaten by someone with, with soy allergy. Other uh, guidance on label reading is to read uh, the label of the food um, 
uh, the, the, the label on the food, every time you, you purchase uh, that food, uh, as ingredient lists are subject to change, uh, different container sizes of the same food may have uh, different ingredient lists. Also, it can be helpful to read the ingredient list um, more than once. Uh, for example, when you buy the food, um, when you put the food into your pantry, and then again, um, as you're taking it out just before serving, just to double check. Yeah, and I know uh, we call that the triple check. Uh, <laughs> read it, read it when you buy it, read it before you put it in your pantry, and read it before you actually bring it out to prepare it. And I know there are many times in my family where someone has caught something that we've overlooked. So that's a really great tip to follow. Um, the next one was about recommendations that you might have, again, for milk alternatives for babies under one years old. Mm -hmm. Go okay. back over that again. Yeah, and we didn't cover that um, really in, in the webinar part um, or in the slides. So for, for infants, so by infants I mean uh, children under 12 months of age, um, uh, for a milk allergy, breast milk, continuing to breast uh, feed is uh, a wonderful alternative. In fact, um, under 12 months of age, uh, milk is not required to meet nutrient needs. Um, breast milk uh, along with solids um, when the baby is old enough starting at six months along with uh, continuing with vitamin D supplement is um, all that babies need. They, they don't require cow's milk at that age. Uh, now if a baby isn't breastfed then um, uh, there's uh, some formula options that uh, the family should choose together with their primary care provider. So um, many infants with, with cow's milk allergy tolerate soy. So a, uh, a soy infant formula would be appropriate for many babies. Uh, but there are a subset of babies who also don't tolerate soy. So um, there are other formula groups um, or at types on the market for babies um, who can't tolerate soy either and these are um, um, there's two types one is called extensively hydrolyzed infant formula uh, these formulas are I'll, I'll give you a couple of brand name examples one is alimentum the other one is neutramogen uh, these are um, tolerated by approximately 95% of children with cow milk allergy. And then those who, um, for whatever reason, uh, soy or extensively hydrolyzed formula is not appropriate, um, can be offered an elemental infant formula. Uh, so that uh, may be an option for, for some infants. But when it comes to choosing uh, an infant formula for a child with cow milk under, uh, allergy under 12 months of age, I really encourage a uh, family to uh, reach out and work closely with their primary care provider. Thank you. Um, and what supplements do you recommend when your child has a dairy allergy? Yeah, so it certainly depends uh, on a child's age and the milk substitute that a family has uh, chosen. Uh, so if uh, a child is, let's say, uh, between one and two years of age and is taking a step to uh, infant formula, if that child is drinking um, plenty of that formula, and what I mean by that is around uh, 500 milliliters a day or 16 ounces, that child is probably getting um, the goal amount of calcium that we're aiming for but would probably still benefit from some vitamin D in the form of a supplement. Okay. If that uh, young child between one and two is still breastfeeding um, then and, and not taking uh, an infant formula, then we would uh, recommend that vitamin D be continued uh, at, in a, a, with the dose potentially adjusted upward, as I mentioned in the webinar, and um, they would potentially also benefit from a calcium supplement. If um, if the child is older and is taking a soy fortified um, beverage, again, if the child is drinking um, sufficient amounts, they may not need a calcium supplement 
but might still benefit from a vitamin D supplement. And uh, any questions around dosing could be directed to um, the child's uh, dietitian. Okay. Uh, we've had a couple of parents write in, Linda, where their kids have, it sounds like, multiple um, allergies and quite extensive, and they're wondering how to provide proper nutrition when there's a limited sources of protein because they have so many foods the child has to avoid. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it goes without saying that um, these families would uh, really benefit from spending time with a dietitian and mm -hmm. potentially having some follow-up time with that dietitian and working closely as well with their, their primary care provider and allergist. Um, in general, um, certainly probably the first step is to make sure that um, of that the quantity of the tolerated protein sources is adequate. That would be kind of a, a first step. Okay. And then I would think that um, the next step might be to explore other sources, protein-rich foods, that haven't been considered or explored before. And um, there's also a possibility that while there might be uh, several um, diagnosed food allergies, there may be some foods um, where a parent isn't quite sure if the food is tolerated. And if that food were tolerated, and it would open up a lot of doors in terms of other options for um, protein, those question marks, those foods that the family isn't sure of, whether or not their child tolerates, um, those questions should be taken to uh, the pediatric allergist because uh, in working together they may discover that some of these um, suspected food allergens are not food allergens. Um, I'll just uh, finish that off by saying that if a parent does believe their child uh, reacts, a f reacts to a food um, but it hasn't been diagnosed yet, that they're better off um, um, uh, not giving that food again um, to their child until they've got further clarity um, mm -hmm. from their doctor. Okay, and, th and that speaks to your prior point too, Linda, about uh, if they do have allergies to be followed by an allergist in case, you know, some of these kids may outgrow some of these things that they're allergic to. So if that's the case, they can be maybe reintroduced in the diet. Absolutely, yes. Knowing that the food is now tolerated means that that food can be introduced back to the diet and visits with a, um, an allergist or pediatric allergist um, uh, at, regulate, at recommended intervals by that allergist uh, can help catch those, um, those remissions, we call them, or child out growing the food allergy sooner than later. And that okay. can really pay dividends, nutritionally speaking. Yeah, and then there's a couple of questions that came in, and it's about how to meet nutritional needs when you have a child with multiple food allergies, or sometimes not even multiple, could be even single, but they have, they're showing signs of maybe anxiety towards trying new foods, or they seem really picky. Are there any strategies that you have to deal with that in the family situation? Mm hmm So, um... Perhaps um, some of the members in our audience who um, are concerned with this uh, found that the um, suggestions that I had there for fostering healthy eating um, um, behaviors and skills in their children resonated for them. If um, if a parent is finding that some of those tips that I offered are easy to, to put in place, oh yeah, I got it, I can, I can run with these, now I know how I'm going to uh, help my child be uh, less particular or um, troubled at mealtime, I'm, I'm good to go, great. Um, the parent who uh, saw some of those tips and strategies and feeling perhaps a little bit more overwhelmed, I, I, I hear it, I, I, but I just don't know how to move forward. This is where a pediatric dietitian can really be uh, supportive. Uh, what a dietitian would do is um, spend some time with um, the child and the parent to truly understand what is at the root of, of uh, the anxiety or uh, pickiness around eating to sort of um, move forward in, in a way that is relevant and real for the family. And it may be around um, you know, supporting uh, a parent um, shift their thinking and maybe practice some new approaches at mealtime. And sometimes just one or two 
changes in tack can can make a real difference and and uh, ease up pressures at meal time and and make uh, the experience much more pleasant and relaxed for everyone and lo and behold then um, uh, children can sometimes come around and and find that they enjoy end up eating um, eating better and enjoying their meals and and uh, going forward in a more positive direction mm -hmm. and, and that was something that you and I just discussed Linda right before this session you you pointed out that sometimes uh, we might think something's related to the food allergy but it could be other causes and that's why it's important to seek uh, the guidance from maybe a professional in some circumstances but to, for me to, for example, as a parent, to not always assume that it's always associated with a food allergy. Absolutely, and you know we can appreciate that um, um, anxiety towards foods and eating, or even pickiness, as we we commonly call it, um, it can occur without a child having food allergy or a medical a medical issue. So um, these are real issues for for a lot of parents, whether or not their child has food allergy. And um, you know it's important to to recognize you're probably not alone out there, and there is professional help, and uh, a professional counselor can sometimes be helpful. But always keeping um, one one's child's um, family doctor or nurse practitioner in on the loop there and um, to to help kind of um, uh, include other resources if, if additional resources are needed to to support um, parent and child through this. Okay and then uh, one of the final ones that came in or one of the ones that came in earlier sorry I should say is that when a food's not good for someone uh, for a person with food allergies, how are you able to detect it? And maybe you can go back, Lynn, and talk again about the, the food labeling and, and what your advice would be if people are not sure about something in an ingredient or something in a food that they might be wanting to purchase or give to their child. Mm -hmm. So certainly if you're faced with a food product that's in front of you and you're reading through the label, uh, the ingredient list and the precautionary labeling and for whatever reason you're still doubtful whether or not this food is appropriate for your child, put it aside um, and, and offer your child something else. Um, but what you can do going forward is um, uh, First off is uh, call the manufacturer of the company that um, produced the product you have questions about and uh, ask them um, uh, whether or not uh, the allergen in question is present in the food. And you probably get um, one of three responses. Um, one, that it's a reassuring response um, from somebody who seems well informed at the other end uh, to say, no, this food does not have the allergen in question in it. Or you might get a response, uh, we, we think um, or we cannot uh, guarantee that this product is free of that allergen. Well, that's also a very clear answer. There may be a third response that where you as a parent feel like, I don't think my question was answered, um, at least not to my satisfaction. So. Um, Obviously, if you're getting a reassuring response that uh, your child's allergen is not present in that food, you may have all you need to feel assured now that that product is suitable for your child. But if there was still, if you still have a feeling of doubt, uh, or obviously if uh, the food contains your child's allergen after all, um, offer your child something else. Um, in general, um, from my own experience, when I call manufacturers myself, I find that uh, a lot of them are really keen to help me um, find out uh, what I'm looking for or get the information I need. So a lot of manufacturers are, are um, very uh, helpful in helping me as a consumer figure out um, or get the, the additional information I need. It's certainly, um, as uh, just to summarize again, um, uh, one should certainly uh, only offer a food to a child um, that one is confident is suitable and if in doubt, um, uh, pick something else for the child. Yeah, and, and to add to that, Linda, one of the things that we had in our house as a family rule, my son was really young, is if there was a new food, we'd try it at home. We wouldn't give it to like a babysitter uh, to let them try it or over at the grandparents or in daycare. And so that gave me a level of confidence as well um, before I would let someone else give him a new food. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So 
I think we've got time for maybe one more question. Okay. And um, yeah, I just wanted to go back and ask about. Um, sorry, the 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 resources that you provided. They're on your last site, uh, but I think it's probably helpful for people to because there are some questions about the labeling laws, and people should probably go back and check out Health Canada's website. And they can, in the search field, look for food allergens. Linda talked about the uh, the uh, enhanced regulations changing in to or coming into play in 2012. And they can find um, information on what has to be labeled. And Linda, also, you talked about how the may contain warnings also voluntarily put on by manufacturers if they feel like there could be a risk for something that's unintended to be in that in that product, but that would be a good source of information. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And certainly, um, as I mentioned, um, if a um, parent wishes to get more help with the uh, labeling regulations, they can always reach out uh, to the Canadian Food Inspection Agency by calling them. Yes, and that's true. And if there's ever, just this is on a recall tip, if there's a sense that maybe something caused an allergic reaction. There's advice on our website as well about keeping the product because sometimes they'll, somebody will come and pick up a sample or you can return a sample or you've got the product code that's all really important information. But um, certainly it's really important to teach children to live confidently with food allergies. And Linda, your information today was very helpful in how families can can um, encourage children to be involved in the process of meal preparation and picking foods so that they have a healthy diet. I want to thank you today for your interesting talk and um, all of your advice that you have for these families and others. And so I'm going to wrap up the question and answer period. So Linda, thank you so much again. For our audience, don't forget again that you can come back and watch the webinar on our website We'll notify you in a few days when it's up and running, but I wanted to wrap up now and thank our sponsors for their ongoing webinar, or ongoing webinar series, Pfizer Canada, the Sean Delaney Memorial Golf Classic, the Walter and Maria Schroeder Foundation, the Peanut Bureau of Canada, and Enjoy Life Foods. While we've received support from these groups, we certainly appreciate if you consider a donation to Food Allergy Canada. As a nationally registered charity, we rely on donations in order to provide services such as these public webinars to support the food allergy community. You can donate online at foodallergycanada.ca backslash donate, where you can also learn more about how your donations make an impact. After we end the webinar series this, or session, you'll see a link to a short online survey through our GoToWebinar that will pop up on your screen. You'll also receive the survey in an email and in, in the next hour or so, so please take a moment to complete it. We're always interested in knowing what you thought of the webinar, what you found helpful, and what else you like to learn about. This now concludes our webinar from the team at Food Allergy Canada. Thank you so much for participating today and we wish you a good day.